Southern Gothic is a podcast that explores the history behind some of the American South's darkest days, greatest mysteries, and most chilling ghost stories. On the morning of Tuesday, May 6, 1947, President Harry Truman addressed a crowd of over a thousand individuals in Washington, D.C., which included fire chiefs, firefighters, government officials, and representatives from industry, labor, and civic organizations. You see, in the aftermath of World War II, the United States found itself facing a new challenge here at home, fire prevention. By 1946, the nation had witnessed over 400,000 fires, resulting in a devastating loss of more than 20,000 lives and a staggering $600 million in property damage. So the president demanded action, and the first national conference on fire prevention took place. The nation has been shocked by a long series of spectacular fires in the last few years, particularly in the last few months, which have resulted in such great loss of life and such widespread misery. Just the other day, the Texas City disaster drove home anew the lesson that we must find ways and means to combat the ever-present danger of fire and explosion. The great hotel fires of last year again showed that we cannot afford to entrust our citizens' lives The conference set forth ambitious objectives. First, the president wanted to heighten public awareness of the problem. Then, he sought to identify the root causes of fires, formulate effective prevention strategies, and advocate for the implementation of fire safety codes and standards in local governments. Fortunately, the conference proved to be a success. It garnered widespread public attention to the severity of the fire problem and catalyzed the initiation of numerous fire prevention initiatives, including the creation of the National Fire Protection Association, which has become instrumental in saving countless lives. Unfortunately, in order to get here, far too many lives were lost and too many families were forced to mourn their loved ones for what today seem like preventable tragedies. Sadly, one of the most horrific of these events took place in Atlanta, Georgia, a mere five months before Truman's conference, when a fire broke out at the Weinkauf Hotel a property that had been marketed to the public as absolutely fireproof, but instead became the site of the deadliest hotel fire in American history. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. With two big orchestras playing such melody that the most proper of proper persons just can't keep her feet still, with the bellboys in their uniforms standing at attention, with French cooks from New Orleans fussing over most delicious things to eat, and attentive waiters ready to serve those good dishes, with smiling clerks standing near spotless register, manager Frank Harrell will on Thursday open the big doors of the Hotel Weinkauf to the public. Everyone is invited to inspect the latest addition to the chain of magnificent hotels in Atlanta and to participate in the merry festivities of the big opening day. On October 30th, 1913, the Weinkauf Hotel opened in Atlanta, Georgia, 
with quite the celebration. The new hotel was now not only one of the tallest buildings in the city, but it included some of the finest furnishings of any lodging in the state. The lobby boasted Italian marble and oriental rugs, the dining room fine silverware, and the rooms included stunning views from what at the time were considered towering heights. It was located on the corner of Peachtree and Ellis Streets, on a small lot atop one of Atlanta's highest hills in the heart of the city's rapidly growing downtown. Urban architect William Lee Stoddard designed the modern marvel, which stood 15 stories tall, although they did omit the 13th floor for obvious reasons. Each floor above the third included 15 guest rooms, and the Weinkauf had two elevators, but only a single staircase due to its relative width on that small lot. But one of the things that made the Hotel Weinkauf so unique at the time wasn't just its size or the luxuries that it boasted. Rather, it was marketed as being, quote, absolutely fireproof. A designation that was pretty significant because during this period in history, large hotel fires were gradually becoming more and more common. In fact, just a little more than a decade prior to the Weinkauf's completion, New York City saw its most lethal to date when the Windsor Hotel was destroyed by a blaze in less than 90 minutes, taking the lives of 86 individuals. So as I said, this designation of being fireproof would have seemed quite significant, so much so that the hotel even included it on its stationery. However, what that meant wasn't quite what folks who read it believed, and the fate that it tempted would prove awful horrific. You see, while the building had a steel frame structure with walls and ceilings made of concrete and structural clay tiles, combined with the protection of 12-inch thick panels of stone and brick on the exterior, the interior was far from secure. The single staircase was made with non-combustible materials, but it was not enclosed by fire-resistant doors, and the hotel's interior corridor walls were finished with a painted burlap fabric extending several feet up into the wall. The room doors were a mere one and a half inches thick, and above them was a movable transom panel that could be opened for ventilation between the rooms and corridors. Not to mention, the walls inside the guest rooms were finished with as many as five to seven layers of wallpaper. Most chillingly, though, was that either out of hubris or incompetence, there were no automatic sprinklers or exterior fire escapes, and while there was a central fire alarm system for the building, it could only be operated manually from the front desk. For a time, however, this didn't matter, as over the following decades, the Weinkauf Hotel operated as one of Atlanta's most notable and luxurious establishments, playing host to all sorts of wealthy and famous individuals visiting the city. And in 1915, the hotel's owner and namesake, William Weinkauf, struck a deal with the Robert Meyer Hotel chain, who leased the building from him, but allowed him and his wife to live there rent-free, which they did for over 30 years. Unfortunately, it was there, in the Weinkauf's 10th floor suite, that William and Grace's bodies would be found in the aftermath of a tragedy that, according to the hotel's fireproof marketing, never should have happened. Sometime between 3 and 3.30 in the morning, on December 7, 1946, the front desk operator received a call from room 510 requesting some ginger ale and ice be brought up to their room. So the night bellhop got the items together and headed up in the elevator along with the night engineer, who's making the routine night check. But when the bellhop got to the room, he had to wait a few minutes outside, as the guest was apparently in the bathtub. So the elevator operator began the car's descent without him, and it was then, as she passed the third floor, that she thought she smelled smoke. 
Upon bringing the elevator back to its resting place in the basement, she hastily ran upstairs to notify the front desk operator, Comer Rowan, who immediately dropped what he was doing and raced up the stairs to the mezzanine, where he saw flames reflected in the mirror before him. Rowan then rushed back down to the desk and he called the fire department, the only call that they would receive from the wine cough on that fateful morning. The time was 3.42. Within only a few minutes, three ladder and four pumper companies pulled away from their station just two blocks away and headed for the hotel. Meanwhile, as the bellhop and engineer went to exit room 510, where they had spent several minutes talking to the guest, they found the hallways filled with flames and a dense cloud of black smoke moving in their direction. Downstairs, Rowan feverishly plugged in every guest's telephone as fast as he could, shouting fire to all who would pick up. But he could only work so fast, and the calls eventually ended when the switchboard went dead leaving the remaining guests on their own. By the time the first firemen arrived on the scene, the hotel was in chaos, and the situation was only growing more and more grim by the second. So another alarm was sounded at 344 to call in more firefighters, and a third at 349, followed by a general alarm at 402, requesting all available personnel, including those off duty, Meanwhile, inside the hotel, there was a quickly growing frenzy of terrified people desperate to do anything to escape the smoke and flames licking at their doors. The problem was that as more and more of the guests began to wake up, open their doors, and then their windows to escape, fresh airflow began pouring into the building, feeding the flames. And once the fire established itself in the corridors, it began to devour the burlap wall coverings igniting room doors and transoms, allowing the flames to race up the floors of the building, spreading rapidly. And with the corridors in flames, that single staircase became entirely inaccessible, stranding guests in their rooms, their sole exit being the windows. So the firemen who arrived at the scene first were left with a dilemma. Fight the fire itself, or save the guests who were screaming from the windows above them. They chose rescue and rushed to set up their ladders. Major General Paul W. Boddy, who led the U.S. Army's 35th Division onto Omaha Beach on D-Day, was a guest at the hotel on that horrific morning. The general and his wife woke up in their sixth floor room when they heard shouting, and upon finding the hallway ablaze, they were forced to wait for a fireman to pull them through the window. Later, he compared the experience to his time at war, claiming, I wish you felt you had a chance in dodging bullets, but you're just helpless when you're trapped in a hotel room with roaring flames all around you. More fire brigades arrived soon after until eventually the city's complete 60-piece fire department surrounded the burning Hotel Weinkauf, a force that included 185 firefighters, 22 engine companies, and 11 ladder trucks. Yet still, they could only do so much, and if the scene wasn't tragic enough already, guests soon began making the decision to take their fates into their own hands and some began jumping from the windows, a chilling situation that only grew worse when folks began to realize that the fire department's ladders were only able to extend to about the eighth floor of the 15-story building. Survivor Richard Hamill was nine years old the night of the fire and was staying on the 15th floor of the hotel with his father Carlos when the fire broke out. Hamill described what he remembered from that night to Atlanta's local news outlet. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. It was very dense, heavy smoke. My dad said to us, I don't think we're gonna make it. 
he could see that it was going to take a miracle. A lot of people did a lot of things like tying sheets together, getting down that way. A lot of sheets broke and they went down. There were people throwing kids out of the window. People were walking the ledges of the building trying to find a way out. It was a terrible scene. Hamill, his father, and a woman from Mississippi were the only survivors on the 15th floor, where he says that they spent nearly four hours filling up the bathtub with water and breathing into towels to survive. Firefighters climbed adjacent buildings to fight the fire from there and were able to rescue some guests from higher floors by extending ladders horizontally across a 10-foot alley. Meanwhile, on the ground, some of the men began using nets in an attempt to catch any who dared to jump from the windows. Unfortunately, not everyone could be saved. A reporter on the scene described the horrific sight before them and the chilling decision that guests were forced to make, describing a woman standing on a seventh-floor ledge gripping her two children. Her nightgown shone white against the flames behind her as she stood on the window ledge, high above the street. Then it too caught fire. She jumped, but she missed the net stretched by the firemen. She landed astride overhead wires, and there she hung in flames. Fortunately, some were saved. Another mother, this time on the eighth floor, flung her four-year-old in the air as the flames inched closer toward them. A spectator at the scene saw the boy and realizing there were no firefighters in the area, raced to help. Miraculously, he caught the boy who somehow was uninjured. Unfortunately, the mother did not make it. Further stories speak to firefighters being hampered or in some cases injured or killed as the result of these falling bodies. One news report even recounted a firefighter who fell to his death from the ladder after being struck by a woman jumping from above as he carried another he had just pulled from a window. Honestly, I can't imagine there's any words to describe how gruesome this event really was. Finally, after six long, excruciating hours, the blaze was done. Tragically, the hotel had been particularly crowded that night. Christmas was getting close, so many were in town for shopping, while others had come to see the new hit Disney film, Song of the South, which was playing at the theater just across the street. And as a result, 285 guests were registered across the 194 rooms. And of that number, 119 did not make it out alive, and an additional 90 were injured. According to later reports, 48 had succumbed to burns, 40 to asphyxiation from smoke and fumes, and 31 to injuries they had incurred from jumping or falling. Sadly, among the victims were 30 of the 40 high school students staying at the hotel while on a YMCA-sponsored trip to Atlanta for a state young and government legislative program. Also, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Weinkoff himself and his wife Grace, both 76 years old, were found dead in their apartment on the hotel's 10th floor. To this day, the fire at the Weinkoff remains the deadliest hotel fire in American history. On the morning of December 7, 1946, almost 300 people were sleeping at the Weinkauf Hotel when that tragic fire started. And according to author Sam Hayes, none of them suspected that anything 
like this could happen. The people who were staying here believed they were staying in the safest hotel in Atlanta and perhaps the safest hotel in America that seen it on the billboards when it came into Atlanta. Signs that said, stay at the Weinkauf, absolutely fireproof. So why were 119 lives lost on that fateful morning? Obviously, you've already heard me discuss some of the mistakes made during the design and construction, as well as the hubris that the designer and operators must have had to omit the installation of safety measures like sprinklers, fire escapes, or fire doors to seal the stairwell. But what actually caused the blaze to start? Well, two days after the fire, Atlanta's fire marshal, Harry Phillips, told the city council that the cause would likely never be established definitively. And that claim has stood true to this very day as the cause is still very much disputed. The fire's point of origin, however, was determined to be in the third floor west hallway, where a mattress and a chair had been temporarily placed in the corridor, and Phillips posited that a lit cigarette flipped onto that mattress by maybe an inebriated guest was the most likely cause of the inferno. After all, according to the U.S. Fire Administration, a mattress fire doubles in size every minute, so it's certainly possible that this is how initial flames sprung up so quickly. In December of 1946, not long after the fire, the Atlanta Journal printed this opinion under the headline, Live Cigarette, Mattress Blamed in the Weinkauf Fire. A cigarette carelessly thrown into a mattress stored in a third floor hallway was blamed by investigating authorities Monday for possibly starting the fire which killed at least 119 people and injured 91 others in Atlanta's Weinkauf Hotel fire early Saturday morning. An open stairwell 10 or 15 feet from the point of origin, which permitted the flames to sweep upward through the entire 15-story building and flimsy doors on the rooms were responsible for the great loss of life, investigators said. Investigators traced the fire from the burned mattress of a folding bed, which had been stored outside room 326 at the doomed hotel. The charred remains of the mattress were discovered by probers when they began their search. But while this theory that a mattress was accidentally set on fire became the official explanation, Hamilton Loki Sr., who represented the hotel's insurer in suits filed by the survivors and the families of the deceased, as well as several other investigators, all claimed that this was not the case. Loki said it was arson. Over the following years, several suspects popped up in regard to this issue, including a 26-year-old truck driver named Henry Body Elder, who was purportedly a pyromaniac. But in 1994, former Atlanta Journal and Constitution reporter Sam Hayes pointed a finger at a gentleman named Andrew McCullough. McCullough was an ex-con who was said to have been at a poker game at the hotel, left the room to set the fire, and then returned to the game. These men who were gambling survived by jumping from the third floor window to the roof of a nearby store and then got to safety by way of the store's fire escapes. Well, after Hayes published his book with this theory, The Weinkauf Fire, The Untold Story of America's Deadliest Hotel Fire, the former reporter who covered it in its aftermath back in the 40s corroborated Hayes' suspicions claiming that he had in fact heard this story back in the day and had even written about it in some of the time following the fire. But he said, quote, I could never nail it down and neither could the police. Unsurprisingly, in the aftermath of the Weinkauf fire, much criticism was placed on the hotel's Titanic-like claim that it was, quote, absolutely fireproof. The day after the fire, Georgia's governor publicly stated, The public is being defrauded when a hotel is advertised as fireproof, but really isn't. Responsible agencies should prohibit the use of the word fireproof when a hotel is not really fireproof, as the Weinkauf 
obviously was not. But technically, the hotel was fireproof, at least in the way that the term was meant to be used, as it had originated in the insurance industry, which was obviously more concerned with loss of property as opposed to the loss of life. It turns out that a, quote, fireproof building actually meant that a structure could withstand a severe fire and be returned to service once its interior finishes were replaced without total loss due to collapse or damage to adjoining structures. You see, fireproof didn't mean there couldn't be a fire. Rather, the building itself could just withstand it. A week after the tragic event, H.N. Pai, the chief engineer for the Southeastern Underwriters Association, warned insurers, quote, even though a building may be of non-combustible construction, the contents, decorative material, and furnishings may produce a fire of serious magnitude as to flame and which will quickly fill the hallways with toxic gases of combustion. If this fact wasn't enough to cause public outcry across the country, the images of folks jumping from windows to escape the blaze made their way through newspaper headlines everywhere and President Truman took notice of the severity of this problem. So, in 1946, a National Conference on Fire Prevention was convened. Previous principles set forth by the National Fire Protection Association were revised to allow the codes to be incorporated into law, particularly the Building Exits Code, which required the use of multiple protected means of egress and the emphasis that was previously on building design and construction for the protection of property was changed to place a primary emphasis on the protection of life. Codes were again revised in 1948 to address the combustibility of interior finishes, fire detection and warning systems, as well as provisions related to the number of people in a building. And the debate concerning enforcement of new fire code requirements in older properties was finally settled. Previously, such retroactive laws were viewed as unconstitutional taking of property, but the updated legislation enabled the enforcement of new standards for existing buildings, legislation that would have saved lives on that horrific December morning. As for the building itself, well, following the fire, the Weinkauf Hotel remained empty until April of 1951, when it reopened as the Peachtree Hotel. Then, in 1967, the building was donated to the Georgia Baptist Convention for housing the elderly. However, over the course of the next few decades, it was repeatedly sold to a series of potential developers while remaining empty, until 1996, when the hotel's gutted lobby served as a souvenir shop for the Summer Olympics. Finally, in April of 2006, a $23 million renovation project began, and the former Weinkauf Hotel was restored into a boutique luxury hotel after decades of vacancy. This new property is called the Ellis Hotel, which opened its doors on October 1st, 2007, and remains open today. Of course, if y'all do decide to visit, be sure to go to the south side of the building where there's a historical marker that is, quote, dedicated to the victims, the survivors, and the firemen who fought the Weinkauf fire. But this historical marker does more than just remind folks of the tragic loss of life that took place there in downtown Atlanta over 75 years ago. It also champions the many reforms that came as a result of the tragedy, claiming it to be a watershed event in fire safety, declaring, quote, the fact that the Weinkauf fire remains the worst hotel fire in U.S. history is testimony to its impact on modern fire safety codes. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Southern. 
Southern Gothic is an independent podcast produced by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider. If you're a fan of the show and would like more content, be sure to join us over on Patreon or become a premium subscriber on the Apple Podcast app. There, you'll receive access to both ad-free and monthly bonus episodes. For more info on Southern Gothic, be sure to visit southerngothicmedia.com today. And as always, thanks for listening. Lucky Lady Shacks.